Last week, I uh, introduced a two-part mini-series within my uh, series in the book of John. For those of you who are new here or uh, are visiting, um, we've been working through uh, the book of John from the beginning to the end, and we're, we're in chapter 7 right now. And last week, I introduced a uh, part one of a mini-series, of two-part mini-series, of G- talking about Jesus and his teaching in the temple, or at the temple in Jerusalem. So, the setting, and I'll just kind of get into this, because, folks, there is something that jumped off the pages of the scriptures to me this week, and I really want you to grab it. I think it's so good. Uh, It's such a, a wonderful thing that I'd like you to grab onto it and understand what the script what Jesus was saying in the scripture when he was when he was teaching in the temple and to do that we need to we need to go back to the context of what was taking place now Jesus is teaching before thousands of people on the temple mount and uh, last week I spoke about how Jesus waited for the feast of tabernacles this is what was taking place in the context of this message today um, there was, there was an eight-day feast, eight days. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Um, Jesus chose not to go right at the beginning of this feast to introduce himself in the temple setting and teach in the temple setting. He waited until halfway through uh, the Feast of Tabernacles before he revealed himself and began to teach in temple courts. So we're reaching the last days. So we talked about some of that last week. And we reached the last day the last day, day eight of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus has been teaching for the past few days in the temple courts, much to the dislike of the Jewish religious leaders of the day. So the last day of this particular feast is significant because it is the final day of the final traditional feast before the Jewish Passover season. So this is the last feast before the Passover And it is the last day of the last feast before the Passover. You see, six months from this time, Jesus would be arrested and taken and crucified during the Passover. So the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles was his last real opportunity to speak publicly with a huge group of people. And just, you got to understand this. The Feast of Tabernacles was a big deal in Israel. There were thousands of Jews from all over the regions that had gathered onto the Temple Mount in celebration all over the Jewish world that this celebration was going on, but they would flock into the, uh, the Temple area. So, as a backdrop to my message, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Jewish feasts and what they spiritually represent... I'd like to enlighten your understanding this morning a little bit. So during the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, Jews were commanded by the law of Moses to erect tent-like structures and live in them during the duration of this feast for eight days. So they, it was basically a camping trip for the families. And they would flock into Jerusalem and they'd set up these booths. Of course, they didn't go to Walmart and buy a you know, a prepackaged tent, right? They had to make their shelters, so they made them out of wood and tree branches and that sort of thing. And they would stay in these shelters. And this was to help them remember that God was their protector because after they were delivered from slavery in Egypt, while they traveled the wilderness for 40 years, living in temporary structures was how they lived until they reached the promised land. Now keep this in mind, until they reached the promised land. And then they had permanent settlements. To understand the depth of what Jesus said in the text that we're going to be exploring this morning, it's very important for us to understand the spiritual significance of each of the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles. So, you see, on the morning, in the morning, right at the beginning of each of the first seven days of this feast, Jews would pour out water and wine drink offerings on the on the burning, brazen temple altar. And they do this 
in memory of God's provisions during their journey through the wilderness. So they're staying in these tent structures that reminds them of how God took them safely through to the promised land. And then they would actually, each of the seven days, they would take a drink offering and pour it onto the altar. So this is how it would go. During the morning procession at the beginning of each day of the first seven days of the feast, they would go to the pool of a group of people, a whole group of people would go to the pool of Siloam, which was just outside the city of Jerusalem. And um, remember, Jesus did a miracle healing a blind man there. Okay. And they took a golden vessel and they dipped it into the pool of Siloam. And, they, and the procession of people would be led by the high priest from the pool of Siloam into the Jewish temple. Once in the temple, uh, they, they would enter the inner temple court where the brazen altar was. Okay. So they would go into the temple through a south-facing entrance into the, into the, uh, the inner temple, through a south-facing entrance called the Water Gate, which got its name from this ritual. The high priest would then walk up the kabesh, it was called, a ramp that was made out of planks, in order to access the brazen altar. And this brazen altar, big altar, was where they offered sacrifices to the Lord. It's burning hot, and the priests are offering sacrifices to God on this altar. But every morning on the Feast of Tabernacles, they'd have this procession. And the high priest would bring both water and wine up to the brazen altar. And there was these two uh, basins made of silver. And the high priest would, would dump the, the water and the wine together, one into one basin and one into the other basin. The basins had spouts that poured down into the base of the altar. And as they as they poured this drink offering as to say, God, thank you for providing for us as we're going through the wilderness and giving us the joy of salvation. The wine represented the joy and the water represented the provision of God in the desert land. So as the, as the priest would pour into these bowls, these spouts would pour it into the brazen altar and it would go and it would burn up into the atmosphere as, a, as an offering unto the Lord. And they would do this every morning for the first seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? The, the wine was made with grapes or honey or fermented grain. Um, it was made of different kinds of, of alcohol. Okay? The wine represented that joy of salvation from, from, from the slavery in Egypt. So, so this repeated act of drink offering sacrifice during the first seven days of this feast symbolized the hope and the faith that they had in God who would richly provide his people to bring them through the wilderness of life into the promised land. So if you get it, every day, the seven days represents the fullness of, God, of, of being fully thankful to God, fully thankful to God for providing for their needs, for giving them joy. And, and, and that's what the seven days represented. Seven always represents the fullness of God. So it's like one complete week. So, Isaiah 12, um, 1 to 3 says this. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger is turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord himself is my strength, my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So this is the spirit of what's taking place here, was what Isaiah said. They recognized that they had sinned. They recognized that God had provided. And this was in memory of God's provision and the joy that he brought despite the fact that they were sinners. They knew they were sinners. The eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles was the greatest day of the feast. It was different than the first seven days. And this is why we need to understand this, because this is going to jump into my text here. The first seven days represented God's complete provision during Israel's wanderings in the desert, and the eighth day represented something different. The people were to rest. There was no procession to the pool of Siloam. There was no pouring of sacrifices onto the altar. The people to, were to rest in thanksgiving, in memory of God's provision, leading them through the desert 
represented in the first seven days of the feast into the promised land. So the day eight of the Feast of Tabernacles represented the time when the Israelites crossed over into the promised land, which was a land of abundance, much different than the desert they'd been in for 40 years. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, a place where they no longer had to live in temporary shelters. They had, they had settlement. It was the promised land. It was a paradise on earth compared to the parched desert lands through which they had traveled. So th think about this for a second. That background that I just explained it's important for us to understand everything that Jesus is going to teach in the next passage of Scripture that we're approaching. So verse 37, we'll jump in, of, 30, of chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. This is loaded with significance, people. And I, along the way in my walk of faith, you know, I've read this many times. It just didn't sink in the same as when I was looking at this really closely this past week. It just sunk in. I'm like, whoa, that's what you've done. That's what you're doing. You see, Jesus is calling out to the crowds of people, the thousands of people gathered on the Temple Mount to get their attention. He, he wants to get their attention. You know, they were there to recognize what God had done. They were there to celebrate the feast for bringing them and their, their ancestors through the desert, and out of Egypt into the desert and through to the promised land. But in a spiritual parallel to this celebration, Jesus recognized that many of these people, okay, the reason that they were there is because they were spiritually thirsty. They were spiritually thirsty. Because of their years of wandering through the desert of sin. Don't, do you realize the human spirit gets... We understand this because you all have walked this journey. The human spirit, apart from God, is desperately thirsty for meaning. And Jesus is here. And he, and he says, Come and drink of living spiritual water. Now, now, in the time of wandering through the desert during the Exodus, God certainly provided. He supplied the Israelites' da daily needs. He had given them the instructions of Moses to guide them. He had given them shelter from enemies and super, supernatural provisions of water to satisfy their thirst in the hot desert climate. And the booths represented... And the, and the drink offerings represented the first seven days of the feast and their corresponding, this corresponding God meeting of the need that God met them. But spiritually speaking, Jesus' statement on the temple courts in verse 37, on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, was him saying something monumental. See, Jesus teaching something to these people and what he's teaching is that he in fact is the fulfillment of all the law of Moses and everything that the sacrificial of the Jewish people was pointing towards in verse 37 Jesus presents himself as the spiritual thirst quencher he was asking he was telling the people that he was the messiah and that the promised land in the Spirit was found in none other but Him. That's what He's calling out to them for because they're remembering their thirst in the desert. And Jesus is saying, you have another thirst within you. See, Moses and Moses' teachings came before Jesus had came into the world. Jesus is everlasting because He's God. right? But before Jesus came into the world, Moses came before him. Moses brought the children of Israel from slavery through the wilderness to the border of the promised land. But Moses could not enter the physical promised land. He preceded it. In the story of the entering of the promised land, it was Joshua who entered into the promised land with the people, not Moses. Moses could not enter the promised land. See, there's, there is a parallel in the spirit over, about this. What's significant is that Joshua, okay, you know the Hebrew pronunciation for the word 
for the name Joshua? Yeshua. Yeshua. Joshua. Yeshua. The Hebrew name for Joshua is pronounced Jesus or Jesus in Greek. Jesus Christ, Jesus' name is a Greek name, but his name is Yeshua. You'll see Messianic Jewers, Jews calling um, Jesus Yeshua, not Jesus. That's because his name in Hebrew is Yeshua, Joshua. Isn't this interesting? The name Joshua in Hebrew and the name Jesus in Greek means Yahweh or Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is deliverance. You see, in the Exodus story, Joshua walked with Moses through the wilderness, but it was only Joshua who led the people into the promised land. It wasn't Moses who led them into the promised land. Moses did not enter the land of promise. On a spiritual parallel, Yeshua, or Jesus in Greek, also walked with Moses through the wilderness. How so? He walked with the children of Israel and Moses in a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. Yahweh, Yeshua, Yash, Yahweh is salvation. Yeshua was appointed to become the fulfillment of all of the law of Moses. And Yeshua, Yeshua was the only one who could take all the people into the promised land in the spirit. Moses, the law of Moses couldn't do that. Lord Jesus, or Yeshua, ushered in a new covenant, in a new spiritual landscape for Israel, where God himself in the flesh established it and was the author of the covenant and the one who carried out what was required. Jesus, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end, he is the entry point. He is the substance and he is the completion. He is the one who gives living water. Not water that you would drink and get thirsty again in the physical, but living water. See, in the spiritual sense, the people couldn't be brought into the land of promise in the spirit through the Old Testament covenant laws enacted by Moses. They needed to be led into a new covenant flowing with milk and honey. Yes, God met provisions through the law of Moses for the people to bring them through the wilderness, but now there's a time coming of a promised land. And Jesus is saying, that's what he's saying about himself here. As it has been prophesied in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, 5 to 9, Concerning God's promise and sending his Messiah, I'd like you to hear this. This is written 700 years before Christ. This is what God the, the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all the sp that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind to free the captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Who is Isaiah prophesying about? Yeshua. Jesus in the spirit. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and the new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. The announcement by Jesus concerning the spiritually thirsty people coming to drink from the spiritual water he offered was on the eighth and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles. In offering people living water, Jesus was exclaiming that he was the author and supplier of the spiritual water that would quench people's thirst so that they would not thirst again. Now, you notice in this, he said, he calls out to everyone, anyone who is thirsty, come. Jesus is making a divine claim about who he is and the source of what he offers. He does not just say he will lead those who come to him 
through living waters, he says that anyone who is thirsty can come to him and drink. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, as God, the Son, is claiming to be the source of spiritual life that the people need. Whoever will come to him will be given living waters to quench their thirsty soul. Remember what Jesus said earlier in the book of John? He, he was traveling through the land of Samaria and there's a Samaritan woman who came up to him at Jacob's well. Well, there was a conversation about the woman getting some water for Jesus to drink and then they had this discussion and Jesus spoke with this woman and he, and he spoke to her about being in possession of spiritual water which were superior to the waters in the physical realm. And John, just to refresh your mind on this, in John 4, 13b to 14, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, referring to the water in Jacob's well. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Folks, living waters are not stagnant. God does not fill us just to let it sit there. He fills us so that the, the, the water of life can come into us and it can come out of us to, to, to meet the needs of others that are around us. Well, what is this living water that he's talking about? The living water, my friends, is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that Jesus is speaking about. God the Holy Spirit enters a person who comes to believe in Jesus as God's Savior. And the anointing power of God's Holy Spirit flows out of a person as they minister to other people in Jesus' name. And those other people include you. The Apostle John clarifies what Jesus meant when he said what he said in verses 38 and 39. He says, Jesus continues, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The living water that Jesus asked the people to come and drink from him is the Holy Spirit. Remember how John the Baptist say, said that one who comes after him wouldn't just baptize in what water, but would baptize in the Holy Spirit? This is Jesus proclaiming that he is the fulfillment of what John the Baptist has said. The living water is the Holy Spirit. Whoever believes in him can drink, as described in verse 38. There are no boundaries who could come to him to drink. The requirements for salvation was that whoever would yield to the call of the Lord God by receiving Jesus Christ by faith. He's setting the stage for what is to come. Jesus is setting the stage for the future church that would be birthed as a result of his dying on the cross and offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins and the outpouring of the Spirit upon his church. This was Jesus inviting people to start looking at him as the one who would bring this. You see... Jesus wants to be more than just an add-on in our lives. He really wants to be more than an add-on. When you talk about thirst, okay, let's think about thirst. Thirst is what? It's the lack of something, right? It's an emptiness that needs to be filled by water. It's the recognition that you need life through the water. That's what thirst tells you. Well, Faith in Jesus is like before you come to faith in Christ, God stirs your heart. He cut, as you might, you might say, he cuts you to the heart. He stirs your heart. He cuts you to the heart. And you recognize, oh, I am so thirsty for truth. 
I am so thirsty for life. I'm parched. Where can I find this? And that opening gives opportunity for the gospel of Jesus to be presented. And the Spirit draws such people. This is what we refer to as the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, did you know, like as, as believers, right, we're a temple of the Holy Spirit? If you believe in Jesus and you're following Jesus, you've, you've turned your, your back on your former life, you've come to him and you've said, you know what, Jesus, I want to do things your way. Your way, God. Not mine. Yours. When we repent of our sins and we believe, because if we believe, if we truly believe, we want to obey the Lord. If true, true faith comes obedience with it, the two aren't separate. You can't have faith and no, and no obedience. You can't just legalistically try and do good things without Jesus having faith in him because it's by grace that we're saved through faith, right? We understand this. A lot of us have been taught this many times. It's a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. But you see, the, the Holy Spirit comes once the vessel is cleaned by the sacrificial work of Christ, the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins. Jesus takes our, our sins when we believe and casts them as far as the east is from the west. And it makes a clean place for the Holy Spirit to come and live in. He cleans us out so that he can come and live in there. And when the Spirit lives in there, it's not like demon, you know, demons can possess people. There's evil spirits out there too and you guys may have bumped into them along the way or if you haven't, you can feel the influence of it sometimes. I mean, we've seen it. And it still happens, it's still happening today. And, and, and the, the Holy Spirit living inside of me is not like a demon possession which takes over a person's will and destroys the person they dwell in and, and causes them to hurt other people. No, the Holy Spirit's influence inside of a believer sweetly dominates a person's life. And his influence flows out of a believer who is indwelt by him. And what we need as living waters, we need not only to have the Holy Spirit come in, you know, in his presence when we're first saved, but we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the Spirit of God needs to be filling us. And, it need, and, and we need to be exercising the gifts that God has given us to do his work in this world. Not because he has to do it that way, but because he desires us to participate with him in his kingdom work. It's beautiful. See, we see an example of living spiritual water flowing into the apostle Peter and out of him, again, living water on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 39, the Apostle Peter, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches as this living water flows out of him to the Jews in the power of the Spirit. See, the Spirit anoints him, fills him, baptizes him, and flows out of him. Baptizes, just overflow. He's just immersed in the power and, and, and the work of the Holy Spirit. He's yielded completely to the, the will of the, of the Lord. Sometimes we don't see things take place in our lives because we're unwilling to go where God wants us to go. We want to hold something back from him. You know, God's, God wants to move in and through his people. Now, not everybody's Apostle Peter, right? No one's Apostle Peter except for Apostle Peter, but there is you. And you're loved by God too and he's got things that he wants you to participate with him in. He wants living waters to be, he wants to fill you with living waters and he wants living waters to flow out of you too. Listen to what happened. On the first day in Acts chapter 2, over 3,000 people came to believe in Jesus on that day. And this was not just because Peter had words in his mind that he formulated that he wanted to present this was not a mental exercise, people. This was supernatural, supernaturally derived. His speech was not his own words. His speech was the word of God as God filled him and came through him to the people, 
to speak to the people. You see, there was this great commotion on the day of Pentecost. People were being baptized in the Holy Spirit. People from all over the world were hearing other people speak, hearing these people speaking the glory of God in their own tongues. They're speaking in different tongues. And, and, and here's Peter trying to explain this to the people. And when he does, he opens his mouth in obedience to the Lord, and the Lord pours in and through him. Flowing living waters, you see what I'm trying to say here? Living waters came in and flowed out of him. See, God doesn't just... So, so many people, and I have myself in the past, approach Christianity very selfishly. I, I've approached Christianity as though I'm an empty vessel and I need this pool of water in me to satisfy my thirst. It's all about me, my needs, my desires. It's all about satisfying me. So I ask God to fill me so that it can just sit there. And I can wash, I can, <laughs> my quenched thirst is, is quenched. Good enough. No, that's not God's design. God's design is that living waters flow in and out of us. We're not to be stagnant pools because if we shut, if, if the difference between the Sea of Galilee, for instance, and the Dead Sea, the same Jordan River flows into them. One's full of life and full of fish and the birds are flying around it and people are swimming in it and it's beautiful. Well, people swim in the Dead Sea too, but you have to have a shower afterwards and if it gets in your eyes, it burns your eyeballs. And there's no life in it. The difference is that one has an outlet. It has an inlet and an outlet. If you have a lake that has no outlet and all it is is just evaporating out, it's not flowing out, it's just evaporating out, pretty soon that water becomes awful stagnant. So here's Peter on the day of Pentecost preaching to thousands of people at the temple. And he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Well, the good news is that salvation and the gift of the Spirit are for all, not just those people there that got saved that day, that were hearing the message. It was for all who were afar off. All who the Lord God will call. God's promise of living water flowing in and through the believer continues today as it did in the first century the same way. The promise is just as applicable to the Gentiles living in the community of 100 Mile House, BC, Canada in 2024. It's just as applicable to us here today as it was to the Samaritan woman and the Samaritans were hated by the Jews who came to the well and Jesus told her that he had living water and if she would drink from that living water she would never thirst again. And it was just as pertinent to the Jews who were listening to Jesus' teaching in the temple on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles as they're listening. And what happened here that I just read in Acts. So what was the people's response in uh, Jesus' teaching at the temple? Well, it was mixed. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Messiah will come down from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Just as many people today, when they hear the gospel, the words of Christ, and the invitation of the Lord, they're ignorant of this, they uh, have differing responses, don't they? Some people think they understand what Christianity is, but they have no clue. They're clued out. They don't know. They're blinded. They've heard stories about Jesus from different people who are ranting or rumoring 
And they might have taken that information and kind of made it part of their own package. Uh, there's a song out there that uh, it's my own Jesus or something. You create your own Jesus, however you want him to be. Right? Create your own Jesus. Mix, match. Well, I think Jesus is this because I heard so-and-so say this. I read this blog. I listened to this thing on the internet. The only thing that can really clarify who Jesus is and what he's here for is one thing. That's the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God is truth. The Word of God is life. So, these people, these Jews were questioning Jesus' authority to say what he said. They didn't know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They made superficial assumptions about Jesus, just like people make superficial assumptions about what they think Jesus is here, right, in this world, right now. They made superficial assumptions that because Jesus had been raised in Galilee, that he was born of Galilee. And just as people today make assumptions that Jesus was just a mere man who happened to have the gift of the gab and happened to collect a bunch of followers and, you know, he, he made some interesting teachings, he's an interesting person, he's just merely human, not realizing the truth of the matter is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who'd come into the world as the Father's gift of save, salvation to humanity. So we sh we sh when we share the truth of the nature and the person of Jesus with others, it, there's, there's going to be division that's going to be caused. Not everybody who you speak to in the power of the Spirit is going to accept the message you had. Okay? Peter spoke the message and God had a purpose to start the church off in that, in that, in that way. Right? But he also was, had filled Stephen with the Holy Spirit and they killed him. So it it, the same spirit filled both, G, both uh, Peter and, and, and Stephen, but there was different results. So there's a mixed, a mixed thing that happens when we share the truth of the nature and person of Jesus. And this is what the Apostle John meant when he spoke of Jesus in the first chapter of the Gospel. John 1, 9 to 13, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he, came, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. So, See, some are going to accept the Lord. Some are going to look at him and say, yes, my, my soul thirsts for what you're saying. And they're going to be open. And they're going to be like a sponge. Have you ever talked to someone like that? Who's just hungry, spiritually thirsty and they're willing to listen and their hearts are just open like a sponge? Well, Peter experienced that and then others you know, like the people that Jesus was talking to who were just questioning him and they weren't really open to God. They wanted a Jesus of their own making, just like people out there wanted a Jesus. Oh, if you present Jesus as just being willing to just let me do whatever I want in my life and make my own rules to the game, yes, I'll accept that Jesus. But guess what? That Jesus is a mirage. That's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is in Scripture. There's too many people looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love on too many faces. There's a country song in the past that was sung that way, right? Or, uh, you know, I've did everything and I've done it my way. This, is, this leads to mirages, people. It doesn't lead to the truth. So we're going we're gonna to hear people coming back on us when we, when we speak the truth, even under the anointing of the Spirit, and not all of them are going to be open, just like they weren't open to Jesus, just like they weren't open to Stephen and Peter in the end, right? He spoke the Word of God and he was crucified for his statement of faith. The early church records tell us that Peter was crucified, but because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus was crucified, he asked to be crucified upside down. So, 
with all the controversy and all the insurity surrounding people's discussion about the identity of Jesus, the temple guards decided not to arrest Jesus and let him go on his way. So you see, it was not God's timing for the crucifixion to occur at this point. God's got a perfect timing for everything. It's good that he does because there were other people that needed to, be, needed to see what Jesus was going to do next. Finally, the temple guards in verse 45 went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? Well, no one has ever spoke this, the way this man does, the guards replied. You see, the living Savior has this effect on people. The guards, they, they weren't sure what to think. No one ever spoke like Jesus before. No one ever displayed the kind of teaching or authority that he embodied. And the crowd's divided opinion about Jesus enabled him to continue his ministry without immediate arrest. And many people held a favorable opinion of Jesus, so his enemies had to be careful how they handled him so, so, so they wouldn't get a riot going. The Pharisees said this, You mean he's deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing about the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing to find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. See, the Pharisees, they're filled with pride. And they were so blinded by their own jealousy and hatred of Jesus' popularity with the people, they ridiculed anyone for believing Jesus. The Old Testament prophets weren't coming from Galilee. Even the religious guys had wrong information. If they would have dug a little deeper, they would have found out that Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem during the census that was taken years before. They failed to understand what Isaiah the prophet predicted in Isaiah 9, 1-2, and we're going to end with this, concerning the future Messiah, which re reads, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zeblin and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isn't that cool? Jesus, the author of life, the word, the living word of God who created the universe. God created the universe through Jesus. He is a light in the darkness. He shone his light in Galilee of the Gentiles. These Pharisees, they didn't see it. He offers people living spiritual water. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off. If you're thirsty and you don't know the Lord, maybe you know all about Him, but you don't know Him, He has living waters that He can give you that will quench your thirst. And they'll become a spring of living water within you that wells up into eternal life. Yes, this is God's plan for you. Would you yield your life this morning if you don't know him to the Lord Jesus Christ on the internet if you're listening? Yield your life to Jesus. The living water of God will bring life to you. You can't get that water by just being obedient to human laws. It stops at the border. It is only through Jesus Christ and his offering that you can experience the water of life that springs up into eternity. And Christian, here today, sometimes I think we need to be renewed. Maybe we've allowed stagnation to occur in our spirit because we've kept it all to ourselves. 
And Christianity has all been about me and how God can meet my needs. Have you ever thought that maybe God wants to change that? If you have a stagnant pond where the water has been diverted away, the best way to bring that pond back into line with being fresh is to kick out the dams. Kick out the dam. Maybe you have dams that you've placed in your heart, priorities that you've placed above God, things where that you focus. Maybe you focused your energies on about building your little empire in the world here. I have in the past. This week I was convicted about certain things in my life. It's like God. God's like, hey, boot. I want that dam out of the way. Will you yield to me, son? Will you yield to my spirit and allow the living waters to flow? Hey, this is what the prodigal son is all about. He came to his senses and said, I need to come home. I need living waters from my father. See, it's all about the spirit of God as a person. And he wants to, he wants to live in you and he, he wants to work through you as a vessel. See, vessels are containers, right? God fills us, and then we pour out. Beautiful. Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, we come to you. We ask God that you would have your way in our lives. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, maybe you've, you've heard a lot about, of, about Jesus. You've heard the stories about him and maybe you've come up with some ideas about him from a collection of people that have told you these stories. You've come up with your own ideas. But you recognize that you don't actually know the Lord and you're thirsty. Come, says the Lord Jesus. Come and drink waters that will refresh you and will fill you and will flow through you. If that's you this morning, you need to come to the fountain of salvation. If you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask, as we're singing here, for you to come up to the front and pray. And someone will come and pray with you. So we'll give you that opportunity. And, and Christians, if we've allowed our lives to get stagnant, Jesus is the living water. He wants you to be a spring of living water that he flows into and uses for his purposes as a vessel. God's Holy Spirit is, is meant to fill you and to, and, and, to, and to baptize you and to overflow you. If you need this, these dams that maybe you've put in place to be kicked away, God can do that in a moment. But you have to yield your heart to him and say, Lord, I want everything that you, you are to live in and through me. That's what I desire, Lord. If that's you today, God, I'm going to pray right now. Jesus, we come to you as a church, knowing that the church is the people. We ask, Lord, that you would, Father, that you take away things that maybe have gotten in the way that have blocked the outflow of what you desire to do through us, Lord? Lord, would you fill us and would you fill others through the things that you would want to do through these hands, Lord? They are yours. Lord, I'm tired of living my life selfishly for myself. I, I give you everything that I have and everything I am to service for you, Lord. Would you feel me, Lord? Would you take the little that I bring, God, and multiply it and feed others? And, and, and would your living water pour through my life to refresh others around me too? Father, we, we know that you are the source, that it's not nothing that I can do, God, but I yield my life as a vessel to you to do what you would have me to do. I surrender, Lord. Bring me back to my first love. Bring me to my senses. 
I'm tired of being away from home and trying to fill my belly with the pig's pods, pig's food. God, I, I, I know there's food at your table, rich drink and food. Father, I want that to be in my life, Lord, and I want to follow you. I wanna, I'm sorry, God, for the things I've done that have caused me to drift away and, and for my love for you to grow cold. Renew my heart, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.